alone among the animals, afraid of death and of future loss. And this was the start of a great tragedy and an even greater possibility. You see, when we become afraid of death, of injury and imprisonment, we become controllable and so valuable in a way that no other resource could ever be. The greatest resource for any human being to control is not natural resources or tools or animals or land, but other human beings. You can frighten an animal because animals are afraid of pain in the moment, but you cannot frighten an animal with a loss of liberty, with torture or imprisonment in the future, because animals have very little sense of tomorrow. You cannot threaten a cow with torture or a sheep with death. You cannot swing a sword at a tree and scream at it to produce more fruit or hold a burning torch to a field and demand more wheat. You cannot get more eggs by threatening a hen, but you can get a man to give you his eggs by threatening him. This human farming has been the most profitable and destructive occupation throughout history, and it is now reaching its destructive climax. Human society cannot be rationally understood until it is seen for what it is, a series of farms where human farmers own human livestock. Some people get confused because governments provide health care and water and education and roads, and thus imagine that there is some benevolence at work. Nothing could be further from the reality. Farmers provide health care and irrigation and training to their livestock. Some people get confused because we are allowed certain liberties and thus imagine that our governments protect our freedoms. But farmers plant their crops a certain distance apart to increase their yields and will allow certain animals larger stalls or fields if it means they will produce more meat and milk. In your country, your tax farm, your farmer grants you certain freedoms, not because he cares about your liberties, but because he wants to increase his profits. Are you beginning to see the nature of the cage you were born into? There have been four major phases of human farming. The first phase in ancient Egypt was direct and brutal human compulsion. Human bodies were controlled, but the creative productivity of the human mind remained beyond the reach of the whip and the brand and the shackles. Slaves remained woefully underproductive and required enormous resources to control. The second phase was the Roman model, wherein slaves were granted some capacity for freedom, ingenuity, and creativity, which raised their productivity. This increased the wealth of Rome, and thus the tax income of the Roman government, and with this additional wealth Rome became an empire, destroying the economic freedoms that fed its power and collapsed. I'm sure that this does not seem entirely unfamiliar. After the collapse of Rome, the feudal model introduced the concept of livestock ownership and taxation. Instead of being directly owned, peasants farmed land that they could retain as long as they paid off the local warlords. This model eventually broke down due to the continual subdivision of productive land and was destroyed during the enclosure movement when land was consolidated, and hundreds of thousands of peasants were kicked off their ancestral lands because new farming techniques made larger farms more productive with fewer people. The increased productivity 
of the later Middle Ages created the excess food required for the expansion of towns and cities, which in turn gave rise to the modern democratic model of human ownership. As displaced peasants flooded into the cities, a huge stock of cheap human capital became available to the rising industrialists. And the ruling class of human farmers quickly realized that they could make more money by letting their livestock choose their own occupations. Under the democratic model, direct slave ownership has been replaced by the mafia model. The mafia rarely owns businesses directly, but rather sends thugs around once a month to steal from the business owners. You are now allowed to choose your own occupation, which raises your productivity, and thus the taxes you can pay to your masters. Value this time in your life, kids, because this is the time in your life when you still have your choices. And it goes by so fast. When you're a teenager, you think you can do anything, and you do. Your 20s are a blur. 30s, you raise your family, you make a little money, and you think to yourself, what happened to my 20s? 40s, you grow a little pot belly, you grow another chin. The music starts to get too loud. One of your old girlfriends from high school becomes a grandmother. 50s, you have a minor surgery. You'll call it a procedure, but it's a surgery. 60s, you'll have a major surgery. The music is still loud, but it doesn't matter because you can't hear it anyway. 70s, you and the wife retire to Fort Lauderdale. Start eating dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You have lunch around 10, breakfast the night before. Spend most of your time wandering around malls looking for the ultimate soft yogurt and muttering, how come the kids don't call? How come the kids don't call? In the 80s, you'll have a major stroke. You end up babbling to some Jamaican nurse who your wife can't stand, but who you call mama. Any questions? Your few freedoms are preserved because they are profitable to your owners. The great challenge of the democratic model is that increases in wealth and freedom threaten the farmers. The ruling classes initially profit from a relatively free market in capital and labor, but as their livestock become more used to their freedoms and growing wealth, they begin to question why they need rulers at all. Ah well, nobody ever said that human farming was easy. Keeping the tax livestock securely in the compounds of the ruling classes is a three-phase process. The first is to indoctrinate the young through government, quote, education. As the wealth of democratic countries grew, government schools were universally inflicted in order to control the thoughts and souls of the livestock. The second phase is to turn citizens against each other through the creation of dependent livestock. It is very difficult to rule human beings directly through force, and where it can be achieved, it remains cripplingly underproductive, as can be seen in North Korea. Human beings do not breed well or produce efficiently in direct captivity. Ah, but if human beings believe that they are free, then they will produce much more for their farmers. The best way to maintain this illusion of freedom is to put some of the livestock on the payroll of the farmer. Those cows that become dependent on the existing hierarchy will then attack any other cows who point out the violence, hypocrisy, and immorality of human ownership. Officers positioned Grant face first on the floor with one officer near his head, a second near his back, and a third officer standing nearby. There appeared to be a brief struggle. Then, a two-year veteran BART officer stands, draws his weapon, and fires. Freedom is slavery, and slavery is freedom. If you can get the cows to attack each other whenever anybody brings up the reality of their situation, then you don't have to spend nearly as much controlling them directly. Those cows who become dependent upon the stolen largesse of the farmer will violently oppose any questioning of the virtue of human ownership, and the intellectual and artistic classes, always and forever dependent upon the farmers, will say to anyone who demands freedom from ownership, you will harm your fellow cows. The livestock are thus kept 
enclosed. By shifting the moral responsibility for the destructiveness of the violent system to those who demand real freedom. The third phase is to invent continual external threats so that the frightened livestock cling to the protection of the farmers. This system of human farming is now nearing its end. The terrible tragedies of modern Western economic systems has occurred not in spite of, but because of, past economic freedoms. The massive increases in Western wealth throughout the 19th century resulted from economic freedoms. And it was this very increase in wealth that fed the size and power of the state. Whenever the livestock become exponentially more productive, you get a corresponding increase in the number of farmers and their dependents. The growth of the state is always proportional to the preceding economic freedoms. Economic freedoms create wealth, and the wealth attracts more thieves and political parasites, whose greed then destroys the economic freedoms. In other words, freedom metastasizes the cancer of the state. The government that starts off the smallest will always end up the largest. This is why there can be no viable and sustainable alternative to a truly free and peaceful society. A society without political rulers, without human ownership, without the violence of taxation and statism. To be truly free is both very easy and very hard. We avoid the horror of our enslavement because it is so painful to see it directly. We dance around the endless violence of our dying system because we fear the attacks of our fellow livestock. But we can only be kept in the cages we refuse to see. Wake up. To see the farm is to leave it. To you. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Anybody else want to throw anything out at us? Sir? Uh, I think you're an anarchist and you don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do you hear me denying anything? Many people, when they hear the word anarchy, think of chaos and mayhem. So they assume that an anarchist must be in favor of disorder and violence. That is the complete opposite of the truth. Most objections and complaints about the anarchist or voluntarist philosophy are not actually about the philosophy itself, but result from people misunderstanding what the philosophy is all about. To illustrate a few points, we will use the example of two fictional islands. Authoritania, where there is a ruling class or government, and Anarchia, where there is no ruling class of any kind. We will use these islands to examine several common misconceptions about anarchism. Lots of people think anarchy means every man for himself, or survival of the fittest, or the absence of any social cooperation or organization. They think that anarchy means everyone has to be self-sufficient. This comes from the false assumption that some kind of government is necessary for any organization to occur. Whether it's part of a republic, a democracy, a kingdom, or a dictatorship, a ruling class issues orders called laws and punishes anyone who disobeys them. 
That is not cooperation. That's domination. It's one group forcing its will on another. Authoritarianism can be used to force people into organized patterns, but that does not mean that people are incapable of organizing their activities without being forced. The most productive and useful examples of organization that we see today are anarchistic in nature. No one was forced to build the grocery store you go to. No one was forced to produce or sell anything in it. Everyone involved in the vastly complex operation of growing your food, transporting it, displaying it in the store, and selling it to you, everyone involved participates voluntarily, working in exchange for money. You and all the other store customers choose freely which store to go to and what to spend your money on. This purely voluntary arrangement allows for an amazingly complex degree of organized cooperation without anyone being coerced to participate. In contrast, under government, a very small group of people comes up with an idea and forces everyone else to participate in it and provide for its funding with tax dollars. In the authoritarian version of a supermarket, the ruling class would tell people what to produce and how much, what prices to charge, and they would tell customers what they must buy and what they must pay. Anyone who did not comply with the centralized master plan would be punished in some way. That is how government does things. Which one of these would you prefer? Another common but incorrect assumption is that if there were no ruling class or no government, people would have no way of defending themselves against common criminals or foreign invaders. Again, this is simply not true. The government version of protection is inherently hypocritical. Governments will use their hired law enforcers to find and lock up some of the private thugs and thieves and prevent them from preying on people. But every ruling class gets the money for its operations by way of taxation, demanding money from its subjects and punishing those who don't pay up. Oddly, every ruling class insists that it needs to be able to forcibly control and extort money from people in this way in order to protect them from private criminals who might try to forcibly control and extort them. In contrast, if there is no government, people do not lose their inherent right to defend themselves from violence or to defend what they have from those who would take it. Every person has this right, and they also have the right to organize and cooperate with each other to exercise that right. Organizing for mutual defense does not require any government-granted laws or authority. No one wants to be attacked or defrauded, and everyone wants to feel safe. Whether each person takes this on himself or herself individually, or whether they hire and organize others to do it on their behalf, it can be done on a voluntary basis. Those who insist that government is necessary often claim that if there wasn't a government, then smaller private gangs would spring up to enslave and rob people. Organized crime gangs exist along with government, and most people do not understand the dynamics between them and how government enriches and empowers organized crime while appearing to fight it. Black markets enrich organized crime, and money allows them to buy government protection. There's no reason to think they would do as well in an environment of freedom where they would have fewer ways to make money and would be up against both individual and organized armed citizens. A criminal gang that's recognized as such has far less power than a gang whose aggression is perceived to be legitimate and proper. And that's the gang we call government. When thuggery is called law enforcement, and thievery is called taxation, and self-defense is called crime and terrorism, then even the widespread ownership of firearms can't do much to stop the aggression. Imagine a private gang trying to do the things that government does without the aura of authority and imagine how a well-armed population would respond to this. 
the gang would fail quickly and dramatically. Another concern that people have when they first consider the idea of a stateless society is that some people are truly malicious, destructive, and sociopathic. The concern is that these people would be free to do anything they wanted and no one would stop them. But this concern is again based on a basic misunderstanding of human nature. Wherever we have a government ruling class, we still have freelance thieves and thugs who are not deterred by the laws of the politicians. In some instances, they're stopped by force by the police, or they decide not to commit a crime for fear of what the police might do to them. What makes this deterrence work is not the legislation or the official badges, but the simple threat of harm to the sociopath. It really makes no difference whether the threat comes from the police or another citizen or even another criminal. A sociopath doesn't care about laws or social rules. He cares about avoiding pain and hardship for himself. This is still true when a government ruling class is not involved at all. If the intended target of a would-be carjacker pulls out a gun it doesn't make any difference to the carjacker whether that person has a badge or whether there's a law against taking people's cars. Discouraging nasty people from hurting others does not require special authority, only the ability to use defensive force. Ironically, though people hope that government will protect them, having a government, a gang which is believed to have the right to tax and control people, just creates one gang so big and powerful that normal people can't resist it. In short, to create a huge gang and then give it societal permission to control and extort people with the hope that this gang will prevent theft and thuggery is simply a self-contradictory idea, but that's what government always is. Some people might assume that if people organize for mutual protection and defense, then that's what government is. But there's an essential difference. People coming together to do something that everyone has the right to do, such as defend yourself, doesn't require any special authority. It's not government unless one group of people claims the right to do things which others do not have the right to do, such as taxing and controlling innocent people. Organized defense can be very effective without supposing the special right to rule over others, in other words, without being government. In contrast, governments rob the people they rule of far more wealth than private crooks could ever manage, making the idea of a protector government ridiculous. Another common objection to the idea of a stateless society is the notion that if not for a group of lawmakers telling the rest of us how to behave, we would all behave like stupid, irresponsible, violent animals. This claim implies one of two things. Either we normal people have no idea what is right and wrong unless and until politicians tell us, or the only reason we want to do the right thing and coexist peacefully is because politicians told us to. A quick examination of your own motivations will show you that neither of those things is actually true. It's particularly odd to make this argument in a society where politicians are voted into power. If the people themselves have no moral code and no conscience, and are just stupid violent animals, why does almost everyone want government to keep the peace and protect the innocent? Would a population of vicious, heartless, evil people try to elect good people to keep the evil people in line? Obviously not. The goodness and the desire for order and peace comes from us, not from the lawmakers we vote into office. The same holds true of everything that government does. If people are so short-sighted and selfish, that they can't be trusted to voluntarily organize and raise money for whatever they deem important, then how can those same people be trusted to decide who should be in power? The implication is that the average person can't be trusted to run his own life, but can be trusted to choose someone to run other people's lives. 
government is really not a civilizing influence. It's actually an uncivilizing influence. People who would never personally rob their neighbors constantly use the government to do it for them by way of taxation. People who would never dream of trying to control minute details of their neighbors' lives think it's just fine to vote for politicians to do it instead. Government gives everyone the opportunity and encouragement to rob and control other people without risk. So government, rather than serving as a check against the imperfections of our nature, instead drastically amplifies our greed, irresponsibility, and malice towards other human beings by giving us a legally acceptable and risk-free way to interfere with the lives and choices of our fellow men and women. Government brings out the criminal and busybody in everyone. In contrast, in the absence of a ruling class, people would lose their ability to ask lawmakers to interfere with their neighbors' lives. And we would not have law enforcers who could avoid responsibility for evil deeds by claiming that they were just following orders. Throughout history, far more theft, assault, oppression, and even murder has been committed by those acting on behalf of a supposed authority than by anybody else. Even basically good people, when they believe in government, will condone things or do things which they know would be wrong if they did them on their own. Most people know that theft and assault are bad, but they imagine that controlling their neighbors and forcing them to spend their money on things they don't want is perfectly moral and legitimate when it's done by way of the political process. Wrong becomes right when it's called taxation, legislation, regulation, and war. Anarchists know better. They know that human society will never be perfect, but it would be a whole lot better if evil deeds were committed only by genuinely nasty sociopathic people rather than being committed wholesale by basically good people who think that violent aggression is okay when it's called law enforcement. The fundamental principle of voluntarism is very simple. It's wrong to initiate violence against any other person, regardless of badges, laws, or alleged authority. The only time the use of force is justified is to defend against aggression. Almost everyone understands this on a personal level, but they've been taught that this basic rule of social living does not apply in the game of politics and government. Most people already know how to get along with others, and most people want a peaceful and just society, our morality doesn't come from politicians making laws. Our ability to organize and cooperate doesn't come from the ruling class. When people escape the belief in government, they don't suddenly turn into violent animals. Our inherent right to defend ourselves and our ability to defend ourselves is not served by government. In fact, it's threatened by government more than by anything else. Ruling classes do not produce peaceful coexistence, but rather perpetual conflict and violence. Our belief in government authority takes our compassion, virtue, and good intentions and turns them into power for people who crave power and riches. Of course the people who benefit most from the political racket will put a good spin on the system and do their best to convince people that it's a social necessity. But ask yourself this, have the thousands of laws, regulations, and taxes imposed on you by politicians made you a better person? Have they made you more productive or more caring? Is the world better off with the politicians taking your money and telling you how to live your life or do you think it might have been better off if you'd been allowed to spend your own money and make your own decisions? Is society really best served by a small class of people forcefully imposing a centralized master plan on everyone else? Can the orders and threats of a ruling class make the world what it should be? Or would society be better served by human freedom and respect for individual rights? 
by voluntary cooperation and peaceful organization. If this second option sounds better to you, maybe you should learn more about anarchism. Some people dismiss anarchism as a utopian idea that would only work if everyone were generous and compassionate. Obviously, everyone is not generous and compassionate all the time. But these people need to look at the other side of the coin. If people are too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be free, aren't they too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be trusted with power over others? Whether people are inherently good, bad, or some of each, giving a person power over others is not going to make that person better. In fact, power has historically been known to corrupt people and make them worse, whereas the discipline imposed by the equal freedom of everyone else brings out the best in human nature. Most people today think that we need some form of government because they mistakenly believe that obedience to authority makes us all more civilized, moral, and peaceful. In reality, it has always done exactly the opposite. Everyone knows that governments can be corrupt, abusive, inefficient, counterproductive, even tyrannical. But most people assume that the way to fix that is to get the right people into power. People have spent centuries trying to create a good society using different kinds of ruling classes, different legal structures, different ways of choosing the rulers, and so on. But every governmental construction has resulted in freedom and riches for some, and oppression, violence, and poverty for others. What if, instead of deciding what the throne should look like and who should sit on it, all people of goodwill embraced the non-aggression principle? What if, instead of looking to a ruling class to impose our values on society, we embraced the concept of self-ownership? These principles are simple and easy, to the point of being self-evident, but they're diametrically opposed to the authoritarian principles that most of us have been indoctrinated with. Anarchism does not mean chaos and violence, or every man for himself. Having no government, does not mean having no morality, no organization, and no cooperation. Simply put, anarchism does mean that no one is your master and no one is your slave. And that's all it means. If you really want to understand why so much of human history has been plagued by war and oppression, and you want to know how to change it, you need to rethink everything you've been taught about authority and government. For that, I suggest you read The Most Dangerous Superstition, available at larkinrose.com and amazon.com. You cannot begin to imagine in how many ways the world is the opposite of what you have been taught to believe. You see the guy who sells drugs to willing customers so he can feed his family as the scum of the earth, while you see the hypocrite who gives away stolen money in the name of government as a saint. You see the guy who tries to avoid being robbed by the federal thugs as a crook and a tax cheat but see as virtuous the politician who gives away the same stolen loot to people to whom it does not belong. You see the cop as a good guy when he drags a man away from his friends and family and throws him in prison for 10 years for smoking a leaf. And you see anyone who defends himself from such barbaric fascism as the lowest form of life, a cop killer. In reality, most drug dealers are more virtuous than any government social worker and prostitutes have far less to be ashamed of than political whores because they trade only with what is rightfully theirs and only with those who want to trade with them. The upstanding, church-going, law-abiding, tax-paying citizen who votes Democrat or Republican is far more despicable and a bigger threat to humanity than the most promiscuous, lazy, drug-snorting hippie. Why? 
because the hippie is willing to let others be free and the voter is not. The damage done to society by bad habits and loose morality is nothing compared to the damage done to society by the self-righteous violence committed in the name of the state. You imagine yourselves to be charitable and tolerant when you are nothing of the sort. Even the Nazis had table manners and proper etiquette when they weren't killing people. You think you're good people because you say please and thank you? You think sitting in that big building on Sunday makes you noble and righteous? The difference between you and a common thief is that the thief has the honesty to commit the crime himself while you whine for government to do your stealing for you. The difference between you and the street thug is that the thug is open about the violence he commits while you let others forcibly control your neighbors on your behalf. You advocate theft, harassment, assault, and even murder, but accept no responsibility for doing so. You old folks want the government to steal from your kids so you can get your monthly check. You parents want all your neighbors to be robbed to pay for your kids' schooling. You all vote for whichever crook promises to steal money from other people to pay for what you want. You demand that those people who engage in behaviors you don't approve of be dragged off and locked up, but feel no guilt for the countless lives your whims have destroyed. You even call the government thugs your representatives, and yet you never take responsibility for the evil they commit. You proudly support the troops as they kill whomever the liars in D.C. tell them to kill, and you feel good about it. You call yourselves Christians or Jews or claim to follow some other religion, but the truth is what you call your religion is empty window dressing. What you truly worship, the God you really bow to, what you really believe in is the state. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, unless you can do it by way of government. Then it's just fine, isn't it? If you call it taxation and war, it stops being a sin, right? After all, it was only your God that said you shouldn't steal and murder, but the state said it was okay. It's pretty obvious which one outranks the other in your minds. Despite all the churches, synagogues, and mosques we see around us, this nation has one God, and only one God, and that God is called government. Jesus taught nonviolence and told you to love your neighbor. But the state encourages you to vote for people who will use the violence of government to butt into every aspect of everyone else's life. Which do you believe? To those about to stone a woman who had committed adultery, Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. But the state says it's perfectly fine to lock someone up if they do something you find distasteful, such as prostitution. Which do you believe? The Christian God says, Thou shalt not covet, but coveting is the lifeblood of the beast that is the state. You are taught to resent, despise, and hate anyone who has anything you don't have. You clamor for the state to tear other people down, steal their property, and give it to you. And you call that fairness. The Bible calls it coveting and stealing. You are not Christians. You are not Jews. You are not Muslims. And you certainly aren't atheists. You all have the same God, and its name is government. You're all members of the most evil, insane, destructive cult in history. If there ever was a devil, the state is it, and you worship it with all your heart and soul. You pray to it to solve every problem, to satisfy all your needs, to smite your enemies, and to shower its blessings upon you. You worship what Nietzsche called the coldest of all cold monsters, and you hate those of us who don't. To you, the greatest sin is disobeying your God, breaking the law, you call it, as if anyone could possibly have any moral obligation to obey the arbitrary commands and demands of the corrupt, lying, delusional megalomaniacs who infest this despicable town. Even your ministers, priests, and rabbis, more often than not, are traitors to their own religions, teaching that the commands of human authority should supersede adherence to the laws of the gods they say they believe in. Several years ago, I heard one pompous evangelical jackass in particular pontificating on the radio that anyone who disobeys the civil authority, be it a king or any other government, is engaging in rebellion against God, 
those were the exact words he used. What if the government is doing something wrong? Well, this salesman for Satan opined, that is the business of those in government, and you are still obligated to obey. Everywhere you turn, be it the state or the church, the media or the schools, you are taught one thing above all else, the virtue of subjugating yourselves to mortals who claim to have the right to rule you. It is sickening the reverence with which you speak of the liars and thieves whose feet are so firmly planted on your necks. You call the congressmen and the judges honorable and you swoon at the magnificence of the grandiose halls they inhabit, the temples they built to celebrate the domination of mankind. You feel pride at being able to say you once shook a senator's hand or saw the president in person. Ah yes, the grand deity himself, his royal highness, the president of the United States of America. You speak the title as if you're referring to God Almighty. The vocabulary has changed a bit, but your mindset is no different from that of the groveling peasants of old who bowed low, faces in the dirt, with a feeling of unworthiness and humility when in the presence of whatever narcissist had declared himself to be their rightful lord and master. The truth of the matter, back then and today, is that these parasites who call themselves leaders are not superior beings. They are not great men and women. They are not honorable. They're not even average. The people who earn an honest living, from sophisticated millionaire entrepreneurs to illiterate day laborers doing the most menial tasks you can imagine, those people deserve your respect. Those people you should treat with courtesy and civility. But the frauds who claim the right to rule you and demand your subservience and obedience, they deserve only your scorn and contempt. Those who seek so-called high office are the lowest of the low. They may dress better, have larger vocabularies, and do a better job of planning out and executing their schemes, but they are no better than pickpockets, muggers, and carjackers. In fact, they are worse, because they don't want to rob you of just your possessions. They want to rob you of your very humanity, deprive you of your free will, by slowly leeching away your ability to think, to judge, to act, reducing you to slaves in both body and mind. And still you persist in calling them leaders. Leaders? Where is it that you think you're going exactly that would require you to have a leader? If you just live your own life and mind your own damn business, exercising your own talents, pursuing your own dreams, striving to be what you believe you should be, what possible use would you have for a leader? Do you ever actually think about the words that you hear, the words that you repeat? You parrot oxymoronic terms such as the leader of the free world, even pretending for a moment that there is some huge journey or some giant battle that everyone in the entire nation is undertaking together that would require a leader, why would you ever think, even for a moment, that the crooks that infest this town are the sort of people you should listen to or emulate or follow anywhere? Somewhere inside your mostly dormant brains, you know full well that politicians are all corrupt liars and thieves, opportunistic con men, exploiters and fear mongers. You know all this and yet you still speak as if you are the ones who are the stupid, vicious animals, while the politicians are the great, wise role models, teachers and leaders, without whom civilization could not exist. You think these crooks are the ones who make civilization possible? What belief could be more absurd? Yet when they do their pseudo-religious rituals, deciding how to control you this week, you still call it law and continue to treat their arbitrary demands as if they were moral decrees from the gods that no decent person would ever consider disobeying. You have become so thoroughly indoctrinated into the cult of state worship that you are truly shocked when the occasional sane person states the bleeding obvious. The mere fact that the political crooks wrote something down and declared their threats to be law does not mean that any human being anywhere has the slightest moral obligation to obey. Every moment of every day, in every location and every situation, you have a moral obligation to do what you deem to be right.
not what some delusional bloated windbag says is legal. And that requires you to first determine right and wrong for yourself, a responsibility you spend much time and effort trying to dodge. You proclaim how proud you are to be law-abiding citizens and express your utter contempt for anyone who considers himself above your so-called laws. Laws that are nothing more than the selfish whims of tyrants and thieves. The word crime once meant an act harmful to another person. Now it means disobedience to any one of the myriad of arbitrary commands coming from a parasitical criminal class. To you, the term crime is nearly synonymous with the word sin, implying that the ones whose commands are being disobeyed must be something akin to gods, when in truth they are more akin to leeches. The very phrase, taking the law into your own hands, perfectly expresses what a sacrilege it is in your eyes for a mere human being to take upon himself the responsibility to judge right from wrong and to act accordingly instead of doing what you do, unthinkingly obeying whatever capricious commands this cesspool of maggots spews forth. You glorify this criminal class as lawmakers and believe that no one is lower than a lawbreaker, someone who would dare disobey the politicians. Likewise, you speak with pious reverence of law enforcers, those who forcibly impose the politicians every whim upon the rest of us. When the state uses violence, you imagine it to be inherently righteous and just, and if anyone resists, they are, in your eyes, contemptible lowlifes, lawless terrorist criminals. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who helped slaves escape the plantations. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who helped Jews escape the killing machine of the Third Reich. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who were crushed to death under the tanks of the Red Chinese government in Tiananmen Square. Like all the lawless terrorist criminals in history who had the courage to disobey the never-ending stream of tyrants and oppressors who have called their violence authority and law. And that includes the lawless terrorist criminals who founded this country. Everything you think you know is upside down, backwards and inside out. But what has to take the cake, the height of your insanity, is the fact that you view as violent terrorists the only people on the planet who oppose the initiation of violence against their fellow men. Anarchists, voluntarists and libertarians. We use violence only to defend ourselves against someone who initiates violence against us. We use it for nothing else. Meanwhile, your belief system is completely schizophrenic and self-contradictory. On the one hand, you teach the young slaves that violence is never the answer. Yet out of the other side of your mouths, you advocate that everyone and everything, everywhere and at all times be controlled, monitored, taxed and regulated through the force of government. In short, you are teaching your children that the masters may use violence whenever they please, but the slave should never resist. You indoctrinate your children into a life of unthinking, helpless subservience. You are putting the chains around their little necks and fastening the locks tight. And worst of all, you feel good about it. Out of one side of your mouths, you condemn the evils of fascism and socialism and lament the injustices of the regimes of Hitler, Stalin and Mao. While out of the other side of your mouths, you preach exactly what they did. The worship of the collective, the subjugation of every individual to that evil insanity that wears the deceptive label, the common good. You babble on and on about diversity and open-mindedness and then beg your masters to regulate and control every aspect of everyone's lives, creating a giant herd of unthinking conformist drones. You wear different clothes and have different hairstyles and you think that makes you different. Yet all your minds are enslaved to the same club of masters and controllers. You think what they tell you to think and do what they tell you to do while imagining yourselves to be progressive, thinking and enlightened. From your position of relative comfort and safety, you now condemn the evils of other lands and other times 
while turning a blind eye to the injustices happening right in front of you, you tell yourself that had you lived in those other places, in those other times, you would have been among those who stood up against oppression and defended the downtrodden. But that is a lie. You would have been right there with the rest of the flock of well-trained sheep, loudly demanding that the slaves be beaten, that the witches be burned, that the nonconformists and rebels be destroyed. How do I know this? Because that is exactly what you are doing today. Today's injustices and oppressions are fashionable and popular, and those who resist them, you tell yourselves, are just malcontents and freaks, people whose rights don't matter, people who deserve to be crushed under the boot of authority. Isn't that right? You bunch of spineless, unthinking hypocrites, look in the mirror. Take a good look at what you imagine to be righteous and kind. You are the devil's plaything. The crowds of thousands wildly applauding the speeches of Adolf Hitler, that was you. The mob demanding that Jesus Christ be nailed to the cross, that was you. The white invaders who celebrated the wholesale slaughter of those godless redskins, that was you. The throngs filling the Colosseum, applauding as the Christians were fed to the lions, that was you. Throughout history, the perpetual suffering and injustice occurring on an incomprehensible scale, it was all because of people just like you. The well-trained, thoroughly indoctrinated conformists, the people who do as they're told, who proudly bow to their masters, who follow the crowd, believing what everyone else believes and thinking whatever authority tells them to think, that is you. And your ignorance is not because the truth is not available to you. There have been radicals preaching it for thousands of years. No, you are ignorant because you shun the truth with all your heart and soul. You close your eyes and run away when a hint of reality lands in front of you. You condemn as extremists and fringe kooks those who try to show you the chains you wear because you don't want to be free. You don't even want to be human. Responsibility and reality scare the hell out of you so you cling tightly to your own enslavement and lash out at any who seek to free you from it. When someone opens the door to your cage, you cower back in the corner and yell, close it, close it. Well, some of us are finished with trying to save you. We've wasted enough effort trying to convince you that you should be free. All you ever do is spout back what your masters have taught you, that being free only leads to chaos and destruction, while being obedient and subservient leads to peace and prosperity. There are none so blind as those who will not see. And you, you nation of sheep, would rather die than see the truth.